You are listening to The New Man, Beyond the Macho Jerk and the New Age Wimp. Your host is men's coach, Trip Lemire. Are you hesitant to talk about the wins and achievements you've had over the years? Are you stuck in the professional friend zone because others don't know about the problems you love to solve? And how can owning your values make you more resilient when things get tough? Entrepreneur and author Daniel Priestley is here to talk about how ego is limiting our professional development and why we need to spend more time creating than consuming. Welcome to The New Man. Today we're talking with Daniel Priestley. He's a successful entrepreneur, international speaker, best-selling author, Daniel started out as an entrepreneur at age 21, and then he built a multi-million dollar event marketing and management business before age 25. That's pretty badass. I'd say that's awesome, by the way, Daniel. I would say it's... (laughs) If I met a 25-year-old who did that, I'd be like, wow, that's a cool 25-year-old. He's Uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, you've gone on to write several books, including Entrepreneur Revolution, Oversubscribed, and Become a Key Person of Influence. You can learn more about his company called Dent. By visiting dent.global. Daniel Priestley, good to talk to you again, my man. Glad, you, glad to have you on The New Man. It's so cool to be on the show. Yeah, yeah. We've been talking for a while, and now it's, it's time. It's time. You, you've, earned, <laughs> you've earned the spot to be I on know, The New I've Man. Been, I've been talking with you and kind of dropping hints, and, <laughs> and like uh, I, I hired that plane to do a sign writing thing outside your house. <laughs> right, and, yeah. Yeah, and now we're here. You we, hired that guy it. to follow me around in the dark, and you know, yeah, just kinda... wh- whispering, whispering little, you know, kind of messages. <laughs> Put Get Daniel, Daniel on the show. Yeah, Daniel on the yeah. show. Yeah, that's good. So, yeah. Well, I, you know, I know how we usually talk when we're on Skype together and hanging out. Um, I just, are we going to destroy your public persona? If people know that you're a real guy with a real sense of humor. Let's do it. All right, let's go. All, let's go all the way. All right, let's 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 just let's let's trash it. Let's trash Daniel Priestley today. <laughs> um, no, and, and seriously, I want to set some context here for the guy that's listening out there. Why are we talking to Daniel today? Well, a lot of the guys that I talk to, they they tell me they're, they're looking for passion in their work. They want to be lit up by the work they're doing. They want uh, what they're doing uh, to be exciting for them. They want it to be engaging. They want to earn great money doing something they feel aligned with, something that's an expression of who they are, something that is an expression or an alignment with their values Uh, They don't want to play a role in order to be successful. They don't want to contort who they are like they put on this act in order to make progress and and to pay the bills, basically. They they would love to build their livelihood around who they are uh, and leverage their experiences and insights and their qualities that make them unique. And many of these guys don't want to just be another cog in the wheel. They don't want to be replaceable. They want to be more valuable as they get older. They want to be valuable wherever they choose to go. So I want to explore how this overlaps with what you call uh, a key person of influence. You wrote a book called Becoming or Become a Key Person of Influence. And more importantly, I want to drill into the mindset besi- behind this, uh, what it means to be a KPI, as we say. Uh, because while many guys say they want to stand out and they want to be this type of a leader, they're also mainly focused on just getting by, playing it safe, doing whatever they can to avoid rocking the boat, stay under the radar so they don't get in trouble. So... In uh, your uh, Key Person of Influence book, you go into the practical, objective, business qualities, professional qualities, uh, but I want us to explore that mindset today. So first off, I'm curious, what are some of the common qualities you see in the folks that you've helped become a key person of influence? So uh, I'll give you a little bit of background. I, When I was running my event marketing and management business, we were taking some of the world's top speakers and, and uh, authors and we were working with people who were CEOs of big companies and entrepreneurs who had built billion dollar businesses and and exited them. You know, we had people coming along and speaking at our events who quite literally had half a billion in the bank. Um, those kind of those kind of people. And um, I got this weird and, and unique opportunity to travel with them, to to be on the road with them, to spend time, you know, after events, hanging out at the bar. Um, to go to their homes around the world and, and in some cases to fly on their private jets mm-hmm. um, and, and go go hanging around with them. And the first thing that you realize um, when you spend time behind the scenes with with these kind of people is that they are profoundly normal. Um, so they're they're very much normal guys. They they have um, 
the same sort of uh, fears and doubts and, and they have the same sort of uh, insecurities and they have the same sort of stupid humour um, and they have the same um, sort of desire to be liked and to be appreciated and all of that stuff that you um, would imagine that someone who's at the very, very top of their game wouldn't have, they certainly have all of that. So yeah. the, the big thing I, I discovered is that these are, these are really normal people. I, I was in my early in my late teens and early 20s, I was led to believe that um, if you want to become successful on the outside, you have to be a real master of your inner world. And um, and I did a lot of personal development. I walked on fire and I broke arrows on my neck and I chopped <laughs> boards and I, I I set fire to my limiting beliefs in a seance. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and I What did you say? You, every- you put an arrow in your neck? What? Yeah, we, we, broke, we, we had an arrow on our neck. We had to put an, uh, a point of an arrow on our neck. And the other end, the other end of it was on a board, and then you had to step forward and smash the arrow. So you're literally stepping into mm-hmm. an arrow on your neck, and it, and it breaks. Okay. Um, well, hopefully it breaks. It broke for most. People. <laughs> we lost a few good men that day. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had. I'm just I, okay. I'm, <laughs> that's way off, right? We we lost. We we didn't lose anyone. All right, but but. <laughs> But I was doing all this personal development stuff, hoping that if I could make myself successful on the inside, then I would become successful on the outside. Yeah. And um, and I, I discovered in many ways that um, it was almost a cliche that people who were doing all this personal development for decades at a time didn't have anything that was on their dream board. And if you looked at their dream board from 10 years ago, um, they, you know, it was the same dream board that they had today. Mm. Um, and And I was really shocked to discover that, you know, really – um, the personal development was making them feel really good and feel really confident, but it wasn't getting them the stuff they wanted on the outside world. Hmm. So that was interesting. And then at the same time, in my is that early because 20s, they were I, focused on kind of they just kind of looking at themselves in the mirror? I find that that's kind of the shadow part of doing personal development. It's like we're just always looking at ourselves and always looking at what needs to be improved and not really looking at what we want to create. Yeah, in many ways, it's a self indulgent, um, yeah, very self self indulgent journey, um, and it can become that. And, um, and rather than showing up in the service of others, you, you really kind of looking for the flaws and looking for what's wrong with you and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had that experience and at the same time at 21, I started a company that took off. I was really lucky. I was in the right place at the right time and I had a great mentor and, um, and I, I basically launched a company and it went from zero to a million in the first year. And then we're doing close to $10 million worth of sales in year three. And um, and I built this national team, and we were tra- flying around the Australia. You can hear I'm Australian from from mm-hmm. birth, um, and uh, we're flying around and doing all this stuff. And I, I had this, you know, company, and I got part of a group that was an uh, an entrepreneur group, and inside that group were some hugely successful, um, wealthy individuals, uh, some family wealth, uh, some multi generational, you know, businesses, and some people who were like self made in within you know ten twenty years they had built a a global empire and had all the trappings of success and wealth. And I, it was weird that it was almost a cliche that in that environment these guys were actually really quite messed up. Um, you know, so the stuff that you know the stuff that they were dealing with was you know they were most a lot of insecurities and a lot of you know, a lot of they weren't confident. They didn't have lots of dream boards. They didn't collapse their past or or do like uh, exercises around limiting beliefs or any of that sort of stuff. They, you know, all the personal development stuff that I was doing. You know, I, I didn't see them doing a lot of that, and I was asking those kind of questions. Mm. Um, but I mean, it's it's strange. You know, right now in 2017, uh, 2016, uh, you can be really kind of a bit messed up and get really close to the White House. Um, <laughs> Really, <laughs> you can be a yeah, yeah. Apparently, you can you can be deeply strange and insecure, and and still be quite, quite and, almost almost the president. And people will think you're really strong. They'll 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 they'll, they'll view it through that lens of this guy's really strong. Oh, interesting. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so right. so there was so I had that I had that contrasting experience. Yeah. And um, well, what and did that, you take away that from that? Like, because I, I can imagine you were really driven at 21, and I can imagine it's been on your th- on your radar to be very successful from an early age. So what changed, right? I need to be, I need to have my interior world, my, my inner self lined up before I can be successful. And then you started to realize you're hanging out with these guys. Say, wait a second, these guys are just normal dudes. Uh, I don't Mm. necessarily need that to be successful. Is that what you started to take away? Well, I took away that it was two separate journeys. Um, Mm. So I took away that 
that it's it's totally a valid thing to want to go through life feeling a sense of confidence and resilience and um, a you know uh, being in control of your inner world and not letting insecurities get the better of you and being able to you know have a have a have a you know be your best self more often than not um, and that's a great journey um, to go on. And then there's this separate journey called doing things that make you very successful in the outer world, um, things that will build a business or that will create impact. Um, and that's a separate journey, but they're not necessarily – a lot of the things – people make one of two mistakes. They think that if they become successful, that will make them confident and happy, mm. and that's not the case. And then the other mistake is if I become confident and happy, that will make me successful, and that's not the case. Mm. So they're two separate journeys, and mm. they're not as linked as you would think. Um, and, and, uh, and, and they're both valuable journeys. So they're right. not, I'm not, I'm certainly not saying that, um, you know, that, that either is better than the other. I'm just simply saying that they're very separate journeys and both of them are, are equally as valuable, but for different reasons. And they're not as linked as most people think they are. It's great to hear you say that. So many of the guys that I work with, they busted their ass through their twenties and thirties and they got to this place that they thought if I just got here, then everything would work out. I would feel confident. I'd feel at peace. I'd feel at ease. I'd feel safe. And that's far from that. Uh, that's their their experience is far from that. And now they're yeah, in this place. Hear, of like, now what? What do I do now? Because I, I was really banking on this to work out. Yeah, you hear that a lot, and you hear people say that a lot. What you don't hear people say a lot is that if you really make yourself confident, and if you really work on your inner world, and you really get your happiness together, and all that sort of stuff, that that will uh, that that may not actually lead to being any more successful in right. the outside world. Right. So you do hear, you, you, you constantly hear that, uh, successful people climb to the top of the mountain and then say what next. Um, but also, you know, very, it's worth, it's for, for many people, it's worth hearing that, that working on yourself endlessly may not actually make you successful. If that's some, if, if that's one of your goals. Right. Right. Awesome. Great point to bring in. Personal development doesn't naturally mean that you're going to be successful in the world. I see so many guys that that think that their lack of success means that they haven't developed something in their personal world, so they go back and do another retreat, more meditation, more this and that, instead of learning some real practical skills or learning how to course correct what they're doing in their in their professional world. Um, they they their their bank account is, is somehow a reflection of their inner world, and mm. um, and they make that 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 big mistake there and they beat themselves up and oh i must have more shadow work to do i must need to go drink mm. more ayahuasca and that'll yeah, that'll of course I, correct my business <laughs> you know well actually you know one of the biggest you know i hear a lot of people a lot of guys say that they want to work on their relationship with money and they want to work on their values around money and and how they feel about money and i thought that was a pretty smart thing to do until i met this guy who had sold his company for 85 million dollars and um and then we got drinking, having a chat, and uh, and he, you know, we're talking politics, and he says that he's a socialist. And I say, really, you're a socialist? And he says, yeah, I'm totally, I'm a socialist. I, you know, I think in income inequality is the worst possible thing. Money's very evil. It makes a lot of people do bad things. I'm sitting there going, but how did you have these beliefs and end up with 85 million in the bank? Hmm. And uh, and and that was to me, that was like a, oh wow, okay, this guy's, you know, this guy's got. A lot of money issues. He's got a he's got a very negative relationship with money, but he has a lot of money. Yeah, great. I, I love I, I, this. Is great to kind of point through some of these. They're dogmatic in a lot of ways. They're things that we just take for granted. Some of these beliefs that we have that uh, hold us back. Let's drill into what's going to help now. So when we talk about be becoming a, what you call a key person of influence, what does that mean? What is a key person of influence? Just so we have some some basis to go on. Cool. So in every industry, there are key people of influence. Um, there, there's probably about ten. 10 to 20 key people of influence in every industry or niche. And they're the go-to people. They're the ones whose names come up in conversation. Um, they're the ones who typically attract the opportunities first. If there's a conversation going on somewhere in the world that relates to their industry or what they do, the people in that conversation say, oh, we should try and get and see if we can get this idea in front of that person. Um, so maybe, you know, we need to get this idea in front of Richard Branson or we need to get this idea in front of Tony Robbins. Um, and, um, and these key people of influence, uh, they, they, they end up making a lot of money because they attract great opportunities. They end up, um, having a lot of fun because they're invited to lots of cool places. Um, and, um, and, and, and they, you know, they're surrounded by opportunity and they're in a really good place. So I, I noticed this phenomenon. Um, I noticed that leading up to 2010, I wrote the book in 2010, 
I noticed that technology was leveraging um, the the personality brand off the scale that millions and billions was being spent on uh, engines for personality brand, um, and that it was worth leveraging those engines. It was worth leveraging that phenomenon um, called the key person of influence phenomenon. If we take you for example, Trip, um, at no other time in history could you have created the new man, right. um, where tens of thousands of people tune in and 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 love your content and get involved in your content. No one has to green light it. No one has to be like the executive producer who who made it happen. You literally have a, a direct relationship with the marketplace. So that's you know that is a an example of of how technology has completely shifted the game for who can be a key person of influence. And there's a unique moment in history where for those who spot that, they can actually become a key person of influence in their industry or niche and and attract a lot more opportunity than they've currently got. Okay. First things first, let's talk about what things are what pe- what things people are doing that get in the way of them be just kind of stepping out and, and getting out of this I'm a cog in the wheel. So I don't want to be a cog in the wheel anymore. I want to claim my authority. I want to use that word. You and I've talked about authority in the past. It's a powerful word. It says that I'm a leader. It says that I have experience. It says that I have something to bring to the table. But most of us are in this realm of this like false sense of humility, meaning that when I ask them about this guy's wins or the successes, they struggle to own them. They struggle to tell the simple truth about what they've done and they've accomplished. They tend to diminish their role and their impact that they've had on others. And then they wonder why they're undervalued professionally. So how can we help a guy establish his authority? How can we help him own his professional value without sounding like a blowhard douchebag? <laughs> well, that's a great <laughs> question. And, and the, uh, and the, the thing about authority is it's it's really it's not for you. It's not for you to be in the spotlight. It's not for you to be um, self aggrandizing um, Authority is about reassuring someone that they're in safe hands. So um, so if you imagine that you were sitting in a doctor's surgery and you're about to get a, a some sort of a surgery to remove a lump mm-hmm. uh, from inside you, and the doctor comes up and, and says, look, I just want to let you know that over the last 15 years, I've done over a thousand of these operations um, and they've all gone really well. I lecture at the local university on this process. I've written a white paper for my industry about this particular operation. Um, and uh, our clinic has won several awards for excellence. Um, so I just wanted to reassure you that you're in safe hands. Mm-hmm. Now, that, guy, that guy's not being a blowhard douchebag. That guy is, is sharing with you relevant points of his background that allow you to relax and know you're in safe hands. Right. So... So the reason we share authority or the reason we share credibility is not to say, look at me, look how awesome I am and all those kind of things. It's to say, hey, if you're going to trust me with your business, if you're going to trust me with your health, if you're going to trust me with a massage, if you're going to trust me uh, with you know, fitness training, if you're going to trust me with any of those kind of things or your accounting or your legal pra- you know, your, your, law, the, your relationship with the law, um, then I just want to reassure you that actually I've, I've got uh, – I've got an angle that I'm coming from that that is relevant and that you can relax and you can enjoy the process and you can trust the process and you don't have to feel a sense of anxiety and does this guy know what he's talking about? Right. Um, it's, a, so it's, a, it's a service. It's a service it's to say. It's an active service. It's an active service to say, hey, this is just so you know, this is who I am. This is what I'm bringing to the table. And for that guy that's out there listening right now, I've got a challenge for you. Go grab a, a pad of paper and write down some of the things that you've experienced and you've created and you've been a part of some of the wins that you've had over the, over the years. Um, you'd be surprised. Most of the people like would like, wow, I have done a lot. I haven't, I don't, I don't, I only oh, focus it, on it, what I'm not doing enough of, but when they say like, wow, I have done a lot. What if that becomes part of the narrative and you, you're, when you enter the room, people know that story and that narrative, uh, watch the doors start to open up for you. And it's just owning the truth. It's not being Kanye West. It's it's just saying the <laughs> truth of who you are and what you've done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe a little bit of Kanye West. <laughs> a little bit. Of, you could add a little swagger to it. A little Why not? swag. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Daniel says have a little swag. Him. Okay. Yeah, have a little swag. Why not? Why not? <laughs> okay. Uh, let's move on. So if we if we go from authority, then uh, we're moving into a thing where people again are afraid to kind of talk about themselves. I hear people talk about my personal brand. And it just seems insubstantial. Like, I, I don't want to, I, I talk to some people and I'm like, okay, that's nice. Like, why should I care? Um, I want to know what problems you're going to solve for me. So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, how yeah, how well, important I is mean, it? Go ahead. 
It's it's a hundred percent. That that that's that's the whole game right there. Solving problems for others, solving meaningful problems for others, is the game. Um, here, here's an interesting distinction as well. Uh, I I often ask people what's the difference between self-aggrandizing and self-depreciating, and um, what would you say? Self-aggrandizing Aggra- versus yeah, self-depreciating. And, oh, I do. I don't yeah. do. And I'm not that big a deal. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. You know, it was really easy. Yeah. Oh, I, I, these other people helped me. Versus, I did it all on my own. It was all me. Yeah. Right. yeah. So the, the the people think that people who are self-aggrandizers, the Kanye Wests of the world are doing something different to those who are playing small and playing humble and humility um, and self-depreciating. But in reality, it's all about self. It's just ego. And it's just ego repackaged up in a different format. So there is one form of ego, which is I'm going to go out there and impose myself on others. And then there's another form of ego, which is I'm just going to keep all my value on the shelf and and pretend that you know that i'm you know that you're an idiot for not seeing it from a distance mm-hmm. um but they're still and, essentially and both, looking in the mirror it's about them it's it yeah it's all about self right so right. self aggrandizing and self-depreciating are exactly the same game uh, they're just different sides of the same coin yeah so um so the 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 other alternative or the opposite is actually so is is going out and serving others and um and, you know, I talk about the guys who've got the planes and the houses and all that sort of stuff. I'll tell you the one big thing about what they do talk a lot about is solving problems in the market. So they're constantly talking about, oh, we need to solve this and we need to solve this. And we've got these issues that have to be solved. And the amount of times they say the word solve, we've got to solve this and solve mm-hmm. that. and We've got to serve this and serve that. And we've got to, you know, we've got to make sure these people are looked after. And we've got to make sure these guys are looked after and these you know, we've got to look after this company. So there's this, there's lots and lots of acts of service, um, and it's getting, it's really um, just acknowledging, you know, that 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 uh, if you're playing small, it's still just ego. Got it. I I, I love that. I love that it's still ego, even if you're uh, pushing it away and trying to diminish yourself because you're afraid to look like one of those guys that's that's blowing yourself up and hyping yourself. You're still in the wrong game shift instead to what problems do I solve? And do people know that? Do people in my sphere know what problems that I solve? Because I think otherwise you get in the professional friend zone or like, oh yeah, Dave, Dave's a cool guy, but I don't know what the hell he does. Like, I don't know who to yeah. send his way. I don't know how he's going to make anybody's life different. I think that's where people are just kind of focused on being a cool guy, a nice guy. Hey, did you send, I sent you an email. Did you, did you read that thing? Well, that's not solving a problem for me. So yeah, come back to what problems do I solve? And I want you to see that the value of that problem is directly proportionate to the, to the fee you can charge, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, there are ways to serve people in non-commercial ways, and then there are ways to serve people in very commercial ways. And some people feel that non-commercial ways of serving people are better than commercial ways. But you know, one of the things, I, and I really challenge people to explore whether it's better to serve a problem in a non-commercial way or a commercial way, because when you can sol- solve a problem or serve someone in a commercial sense, what typically happens is that it becomes uh, very e- easy to expand. So if you're, com- if you're solving problems in commercial ways and you're gathering pace with money, you can be solving problems for more and more and more people, and you can suddenly have thousands of clients, tens of thousands of clients. Um, and also, when people pay you, they take it really seriously. So um, I've seen people who show up with their best friend uh, and do lots and lots and lots of, you know, listening to stories and grief and, you know, depression and all that sort of stuff in a, in a tough time, which is a non-commercial solution. And then that same guy will go and spend a hundred pounds with a life coach or, or you know, a thousand pounds with a life coach or, or something like that. And in one session, have a total breakthrough on the thing and get out of the funk. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and sometimes just putting, you know, paying for a service is actually um, is actually pretty liberating and 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 speeds things up and works right right. Let's talk about having meaning, right? So this this podcast, my listeners, if they, they're not listening to this because they want to just chase money, they're not listening to this just because they want to have quote success. They want to do that, but they want to have it with meaning. They want to have it have it mean something to them. They want to have an impact. They want that satisfaction in knowing that this aligns with their values. Um, Simon Sinek talks about having a strong why for what we do. That's the doorway to having meaning. So how can having a strong why help the guy that's listening in a, in a professional way? Because so many guys out there kind of like, again, they're playing this role. They don't talk about what they value. They don't talk about what's really passionate to them at the workplace. Cause that's not, well, it's vulnerable. 
to do that. So mm-hmm. how can how can it be an asset to say, hey, here's what I stand for. Here's what I really care about. Yeah, well, I recently read a book book by Simon Sinek, uh, sorry, a blog by Simon Sinek, where he said also a key distinction is that you don't even have to come up with the why. So sometimes you discover a why that lights you up, and that's just as valid as coming up with your own. So, um, you know, there are certain people who heard uh, Martin Luther King's why and said, yeah, okay, I want to adopt that why. Um, and uh, certain people heard uh, Bill Gates's why, and they said, yeah, okay, I want to be part of putting a PC in every home and every desk across America. Mm. So it's it's totally valid that you don't necessarily, in order to have a valid why, it doesn't have to be something that you personally came up with. And that was the point he was making in the blog, which mm-hmm. I think is a really powerful point um, that you can hear someone else's why and say, I love that. I want right. to, that's actually, that's, that's cool. There's nothing wrong with saying, actually, that's, that's what I've been looking for. Uh-huh. Um, so, I mean, a, a why is valuable for a number of reasons. It's valuable for resilience. So um, it allows you to stay in the game long enough to not eject. And, um, and it allows you to stay with problems longer um, so if there's no if there's no strong why you tend to give up on a problem too soon, um, and uh, you know there's that great scene in Apollo 13 where they tip all the materials on the desk and say we have to build a air filtration system in the next two hours out of these bits or else our astronauts aren't coming home. Mm. And because they knew why they were doing it, they just what they thought could not be done, they figured out how to do in a couple of hours. That's where we get um, grit, right? The grit to follow through, the grit to stay with it. It's it's it, it's rooted in that having that why. Yeah, the intensity's there. Yeah. Um, and um, and the other thing I think is a very, I don't know. I think there's something about being a man that uh, wants you to rise to a challenge, and it does. Like, I, if you look at. Um, like male lions versus female lions in in Africa, male lions just lay around in the shade and don't do much, and they're just constantly laying around not doing anything. And the female lions are out there hunting constantly and always bringing in food and always bringing in stuff and bringing it back to the pride and making sure everyone's fed, Um, except when there's a threat. And when there's a threat of a pack of hyenas or something, then the male lion springs into action and, and, and totally takes care of everything. And what I've noticed with a lot of my male friends is that they really need a challenge to rise to. And if they don't have that challenge, they're kind of just laying about. Mm. Uh, um, but, you know, I've, I've had some of my friends who, you know, a, a classic experience is, is um, that when they didn't have kids, they made 45,000 pounds a year. And they made 45,000 pounds a year because that was enough to pay rent and to go out and party and to have have enough fun and to go on an annual holiday and, you know, to buy a snowboard. And that was all that was all cool. And then when they had kids and they had to pay for nannies and medical insurance and and, um, you know, other expenses that they'd never seen coming very rapidly, they expand their income up to 70 or 80,000 pounds a year because that's now the new number that's required in order to 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 put a roof over the family. Mm -hmm. Um, so they rise to that challenge. Um, and I, (laughs) I tell, I tell a lot of the young guys that I mentor, you know, I want you to pretend you've got a kid. Um, I want you to set up a, uh, set up a bank account called my baby. Um, and, um, and, and make sure that every week it gets fed. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and don't, you know, don't, uh, take that out of what you currently earn, go out and figure out some new thing. Right. Um, to you know, rise to the challenge. Don't don't scrape off a little bit on the side. Rise to the challenge of that, and that's kind of part of that. Having a why, you know, having a reason, having a reason to act, having having something that really causes you to to, to rise to the challenge. I like that. A lot of us are thinking, well, I'm at this level, <clears throat> you know, I would have to. How am I going to scale what I'm doing? It's really hard or whatever. But like when you click into that gear and you find that powerful why for whatever you, for whatever it is, it doesn't have to be that. You're going to create some monumental change on the planet. It might just be that, okay, I've got a baby on the way. It's time to kick it in this gear. We suddenly access this more resourceful, creative part of ourselves. It's amazing what we can get done. The other part of the why that I wanted to say is that I, that's where I get inspired to help others. You know, if some guy just says, hey, Trip, I want you to help me to make X amount more this year, I don't care. Like, I'll just be like, go find another performance coach. I'm not, that's not my bag. Yeah. But if he comes to me and says, here's why, here's what it's for, here's why this is important. I want to help the guy that was like me 10 years ago. I want to do it for this thing. I'm on board and I might even like wave my fee. You know, I'm like, yes, let's do this. I want to be a part of this. I want you to see this happen. So that why is the single most important thing. It's not the dollar amount. Um, it's not necessarily even the like the 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 end result, the outcome. 
it's uh, it's why he's doing it. Like if he brings that inspiration, that's what enrolls me and has me be on board. I want to support him. And those in, those enrollment conversations are vital. They're they're non negotiable. You have to have them if you want to achieve any level of success. So um, you know, we currently in my company we have fifty employees, and a lot of them are young people. They're in their twenties, and they're really bright, really talented. You know, exuberant. You know, amazing, full of energy. You know, twenty somethings. And the reason they work for the company is because of the why. Um, they're not there because we're paying them extraordinary amounts of money. All of them could go get internships at a bank and earn <laughs> and earn a lot more money, or, or go and get jobs at a bank and earn a lot more money. But they're there because they hear the why and they hear what we're up to in the world, and then they enroll. And then we have two and a half thousand clients around the world, and they they all come along because they hear what we're up to and and the why. Beautiful, uh, yeah. So the the message out there is. All right, you might be wanting to push away this why. You might want to keep it stuffed. You might not think it's ready yet or whatever, but bottom line, it's vulnerable. It's vulnerable to share our why. What if your why could be an asset? What if it's the thing that's really going to help you create what you're what you're looking to create? Yeah, and it's also, it's really normal that your why starts out as a bit of a rant. So, uh, you mm-hmm. know, people think that they should have this really articulate why, that they should, you know, to put a computer on every desk in every home across America, you know, the the, the Microsoft why or, you know, we choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Uh, the, the JFK moon speech, why? Um, but but in, in most cases, what starts out um, as your why tends to be a rant uh, that you, you kind of, it's hard to put it into words. It's a feeling that you've got. It's something that bubbles up a bit of emotion inside you. And you've got to rant it a few times. When I say a few times, I mean a few hundred times in order in order to articulate it properly. And it's only... It's only when you kind of get get it, you know, kind of moving out of your body, that um, that it starts to take some shape in the, you know, in 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 an articulate way. I don't know how many conversations I've had with guys over the years around this subject. We could call it mission, right? And and they're they're usually looking outside of themselves. They're they're looking for something that's out there. And and I found that a lot of times those pursuits are egoic, right? Oh, this is what this is a good mission to attach my identity to. This is what's going to make me look good. But the ones, the, the missions like when, that I see that create this resilience and, and have this staying power are the ones that are really related to the guy, some version of himself, whether it was 10 minutes before or 10 years before, 20 years before, when he knows that guy, like, I want to help that guy, I want to help those people um, get through this ordeal, they know what it's like to be in those shoes, they, they know if, I, if they had this solution it would have made such a huge difference that's where i found these missions to have such staying power and resilience and uh where they, it, they can really have that nice slow burn instead of answering the question what's going to make me look good those things tend to be very rocky up and down and, and yeah, hard to stick and, to and we're pretty hardwired to pick up on that now i think there might have been a time where people didn't have the emotional intelligence to to spot that but but you can spot now pretty quickly as soon as someone's got a why that uh, or a mission it is about looking good going nowhere. Yeah. Okay. Let's say a guy's stuck in a rut with his own company, or maybe he's playing a role at a company and he's doing pretty well, but he's, he's in a rut. And um, so I'm curious, out of, out of some of the things we've talked about today or, or the world that you come from, uh, what are some ways that he can change lanes for the better without ending up on his ass? Yeah. So we look at this idea that um, environment is really important to the way people perform um, so I don't know if we've we've mentioned this, but you know what we actually do is run business accelerators around the world, where we have company, where we have leaders of companies come into a business accelerator and spend nine months in an environment that that transforms their leadership style and um, and transforms them into a key person of influence in their industry. So we look at environment, and there's four factors that we think are really important when it comes to transforming the way someone performs. So number one would be um, would be current best practices that they actually, that they're around great ideas. Another word for current best practice would be like, you know, just great ideas. Um, and that they they get around people who know how to do stuff. So um, uh, the, second, the second one would be peer group, that you spend time with people who actually lift you up and spend time with people who have the kind of results going on that you would want. Um, uh, people that would normalize a, a certain level of performance or a certain result. Um, so if you wanted to play better tennis, hanging around with a tennis club where people practice tennis and are good at tennis is a great, you know, is a great uh, thing that normalizes that. Number three is to get someone else to hold you accountable, uh, which is around that idea that 
that we need someone to kind of uh, hold us to a higher standard and it's not something we can typically hold ourselves to. Um, and then the, the fourth one is to get around more resources. So, um, you know, sometimes you just need to have access to the right resources to make things happen. Um, and, 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 you know, so, so it's really looking at the environment, the old, you know, there's a, there's an idea that, um, that there are good people and bad people and successful people and unsuccessful people and happy people and sad people. And, um, and then I kind of have this idea now that there's environment and that, that you tend to behave in accordance to the environment that you're in. And when I say environment, I don't mean, you know, being in the right physical environment, although that helps, but, you know, part of having a great environment is having a great coach who holds you accountable and, and who is checking in with you and has perspective that you don't have and isn't too close to your situation so that they can actually um, uh, help to, you know, help to spot things that you're not spotting. Mm -hmm. So that's part of environment. Mm -hmm. um, and if someone wants to just take little steps in the right direction, let's say someone is in a bit of a funk, um, uh, I, I'm a big believer that you should try and create, not consume. So consuming is about watching lots of videos, reading lots of video, reading lots of books, attending lots of events and all those sorts of things. And I'm a big believer that actually what gets you out of a funk is creating stuff. So creating a book, uh, creating a, a YouTube video, uh, creating an event, putting together a meetup group, um, and actually coordinating something and creating something and, ha and bringing something into the world uh, as an act of creation as opposed to an act of consumption. So um, all through our lives, we're taught to be consumers. We we consume products when we're you know when we when we need something. We consume entertainment, um, and actually, the real juice is in is being the source of that. So actually, being on the creating side versus the consuming side. So if you're in a funk, uh, one of the things that I know puts people in a funk is overconsumption. They're just consuming too much. Um, they'll be consuming too much news. They'll be consuming too many YouTube videos. They'll be consuming too many books. They'll be consuming whatever they consume, drugs, alcohol. They're consuming too many things, whatever it is. And um, and the real flick of the switch is is when you move into creation. Beautiful. I love that. Uh, get out of consumption. Get into creation. After you listen to this podcast, turn it off. Go out and make something. <laughs> Exactly. Don't <laughs> don't read my book. Whatever you whatever you do, don't read my book. You got to go write your own book. I, man, I, you would be surprised. I talked to some guys. They're like, yeah, I listen to podcasts at three x speed. I just listen to them all day long. I'm like, how can that help in any way? Yeah. Like, it's insane. How do, how does that even yeah. give your mind space to to come up with ideas and try things? And uh, when you're in this constant, yeah, uh, the, like the ear, like all your sense uh, sensory inputs are just getting flooded with information. Um, so I'm so yeah. glad to hear that, that point. That's powerful. Um, tell us a little bit about Dent, what you're talking, you mentioned these business accelerators. Uh, tell us about some of the programs you guys are running all around the world. Yeah. So we operate in, uh, Australia, Singapore, UK, and USA. Um, we have business accelerators with, um, with top entrepreneurs from around the world who, who come in and, um, and, and teach programs and put, put people through the accelerators. We focus on, uh, changing the environment of the leader. So we surround them with a new peer group and best practices around how to get stuff done, give them access to resources. So sometimes we raise people money um, and, uh, and and hold them accountable. We're, you know, we do those sorts of things. That's, that's the accelerators that we run. Um, and we believe that entrepreneurship is a journey. So we take people from very early stage ideas uh, over the, you know, get them over 100 grand in revenue so that they start hitting that kind of 10 grand a month um, in sales and then we change gear and put them on a different accelerator that is kind of from six to seven figure revenue. And then we've got another accelerator that is about going from seven figure to eight figure revenue. Um, so we do something called the threshold accelerator at the start, the key person of influence accelerator about the leader. And then we do something called 24 assets, which is about uh, building a business that takes on a life of its own and having all the digital assets um, that allow for scale and um, robustness and, um, and value, you know, if you want to sell it or exit it or raise money for it. Um, so we do all, we do that whole journey. Um, and, uh, and we got some people who have built, you know, phenomenal successful companies who lead that journey. And, um, yeah, we've been doing it six years. We've, we've won lots of awards. We have a lot of fun. Um, and, and, and people get massive separation anxiety when they get to the end of it. Mm. So, uh, so <laughs> that's how we measure success. <laughs> when they got to get more, right? Yeah. When they when they get to the end and they go, oh, I don't want it to be over. Yeah, 
Yeah, beautiful. Uh, Daniel Priestley, guys, go out and check out his books on Amazon. Visit dent.global to learn more. Thank you so much, buddy. Uh, Thank you very much. If these interviews are helping you, then please visit The New Man on iTunes and leave us a positive review so others can discover the show more easily. Thanks for listening.